Hello, I'm Regina McCann Hess, president of Forge Wealth Management, and welcome to our Women in Wealth series. Today, I have a new friend, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with her. And can you tell us who you are, what you do, and what you love about what you do? Yes, uh, my name is Ginevra Chuck, and I am the director of client value add programs at FS Investments. So, Regina, thank you so much for having me today. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I am, uh, as I said, Director of Value Add Client Programs, which kind of seems like a made-up title, and it it almost is a made-up role. I'm really lucky that I get to do what I do. We, as a, as a company, are an asset manager in the alternative investment space, right? And so my background was on our sales team, um, working with our regional directors, connecting with advisors like yourself to try and find which of our alternative assets might have been a solution for your investors. Um, now I'm on the marketing team. And what I do with our value add programs is almost like a business development exercise, also kind of like a consultant. So I'm really helping our clients, which are financial advisors, or even if you have any sort of home office contacts, trying to help you be the best at whatever it is that you do. So we use this really fun co-centric framework focusing on you as an individual. So whoever that you is, I always say you can't love others till you love yourself. Um, then we work to help you and your team. So we, you know, our value add programs can help you with a lot of wellness type stuff. So that could be um, nutrition, mindset, movement, whatever it might be that you're trying to, to work on as an individual. Um, a lot of career development type stuff values exploration, which I'd love to get into. Then we look at your team. So helping you and your team, then we move out to you and your business. That's where you think of more traditional value add. So practice management, um, consulting or uh, business valuation for business owner clients. And then we look at your community. So what are ways that you and your business and your team can make an impact in the broader community? Um, so working with different speakers or helping you maybe identify some community service that you're interested in getting connected to. Um, it really can be tailor-made to whoever I'm having a conversation with, which is what makes it really, really fun. Um, so, and that's what I love about it. You know, I, every day I get to connect with different advisors or different home office contacts and figure out what's important to them and then try and find a solution or a value add program that makes the most sense for them. Oh my gosh. So you never have the same day twice. Uh, there's so many things in there that you can do. And I, there's just a plethora, like, oh my gosh, no wonder you have like a crazy giant title because there's a lot of stuff that you pack in there. It's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, because my background started in sales uh, and, and I'm sure you can understand this as an advisor, everything we do is, is trying to be consultative. No advisor is the same, just like no client that you're working with, no investor is the same. So it's really important for me to understand what's important to the person that I'm talking to, and then tailoring each individual experience or conversation to, you know, make sure that whatever we're talking about is most relevant for them. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a huge part of, of my process is trying to make sure that I'm being consultative and tailoring uh, what we're talking mm -hmm. about to what's important to who we're communicating with. Yeah. And that's, that's so important because you're partnering with people and tr instead of trying to sell something, you're partnering. And that goes such a long way to develop the relationships and to develop ways to help, you know, your client and ultimately helping our clients. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. No day is like you said, no day is the same. Um, it does make things very fast paced. Um, you know, one of the things that's probably challenging about what I'm doing is that, uh, because I'm going, it's just myself and one other person on my team. So we're, we're small and mighty, even though we, um, sit as a part of the, the broader marketing department, which is great because we do have access to those resources. Um, we do have a lot of times, and again, you can probably relate to this. We have a lot of people who want to partner with us and offer their value add programs to our clients. And so I do have to spend a lot of time trying to um, suss out what's good, what's relevant, um, what makes the most sense. So that sometimes can be uh, the hard part of the job is just trying to understand. I, I don't want to assume that I know that something's good. So, you know, I have to take the time to like, okay, 
explain to me what it is that you do. Now I have to go to my stakeholders, you know, the people, my, my managers, Mm -hmm. uh, the people in charge of the budget, and then the people who would actually be utilizing this program to say, I think this is a good idea. Here's how much it costs. Here's what the impact would be. Um, and so that's the, the part of the job that's definitely, um, the diligence process, right? Like for you, that's oh, yeah. determining. <laughs> yeah, and that's so, yeah, it's so important too, because, you know, you, it's a lot of noise, right? Oh, look at this. This is great. This is great. But then you have to get to the, uh, you know, like kind of the onion, you get, there's multiple layers of it and you have to get uh, into the core of it to see what really is there and how much uh, impact it really will have. And is it worth the time, the energy and the money? Yes, a hundred percent. Um, and so I know one of the, um, one of the things that we had talked about in earlier conversations, because I was actually introduced to you when you came to our company to, uh, as part of our, we have a couple of what we call employee resource groups, Um, which is one of the things I actually love about our company is that we invest in things that, that our actual employees are interested in. So this was our, um, women's network. I'm also a member of our FS in color network, as well as our family network. We also have an FS heroes network, and then we have, um, FS pride. So these are basically, I don't know, you could call them special interest groups, um, and there's, there's a variety of different ways that you can engage with them. You were here to help um, as the Women's Network brought you in to talk about, I guess you could probably explain it better, but like personal finance, sort of like basic finance 101s, which I thought was so interesting and super valuable. Um, uh, but one of the things that I think is really important there is like the idea of I work for an organization that understands what the employees want and then connects us with resources like you, which I think are super valuable and very important. Yeah. And that was, it was a great event. I mean, obviously it shows like just being there on your campus. First of all, the campus in your building is absolutely beautiful. And, and that was not the first time I've been in your building. They offer occasionally educational events for financial advisors to come and learn as well, which is mm-hmm. it has a big impact on us and helps us help our clients, right? But being there with the energy in that room with all the people in there, and I'm not going to say which is women, there were men there too, which I loved. And I had as many questions from the men as I did the women, which made me feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm doing a good thing here. I'm like saying the right things that people need to hear because I'm getting the right types of questions. So I loved it. But the energy in that room and the fact that we had so many people turn out and like were engaged in the conversation and wanted to take it a little bit further was was really a win, uh, I think, for both FS Investments and myself. I, I had a great uh, visit with you guys. Or girl, and girls, right? I That's always right. say the, guys, sorry. The guys and girls. I know. <laughs> I know. And so um, one of the one of the things in my background that we haven't touched on yet is I actually in between my current role as uh, running value add programs and my time on the sales desk, I, um, I was also one of the sales desk managers. Um, so I, I did a lot of coaching and mentoring, which I really loved and I, you know, love to, to talk about, but I actually left FS, um, to go be an English as a second language teacher in Argentina on a Fulbright scholarship. And amazing. yes, it was a, a, a really interesting experience. You know, there's so much we could talk about there around like identities. And I had basically always been like a career you know, I was good at my job. I was married. I'm still married, was married to my husband. We owned a house. I had a dog. And then all of a sudden when I left and and moved to Argentina, none of those titles applied to me anymore. And so I know in some of the work you, you do, um, as a divorce specialist, I'm sure that that sometimes is a theme that comes up is like people all of a sudden their, their understanding of themselves and their relationships changes. Um, And so one of the things that was really important to me during that time and that transition was this idea of understanding my motivators and my value system, because when you strip away these titles and these identities that you've always understood, what's really at the crux is like, what do you care about? What do you stand for and what's important for you? Um, And so I think that's, you know, something that for me in my career in finance has always been really important. 
And I know that's something even in understanding your background that's that's been important and stood out for you. Um, you talk about like being a caretaker, whether yeah. you're taking care of people's health when you were a nurse or taking care of people's finances as a financial advisor. So I think that's something that's always been really important for me in this industry so far. Yeah, it's it's, it's such a good way to look at things like, you know, you're in the right career when you're excited about helping somebody and you know that you're doing a good thing and, you know, that's your job, right? And And you're doing good in the world. You're bringing about working towards good results um, as opposed to just looking, oh, well, here's the bottom line. No, you're, you're actually helping people, which is, is, is a great feel good. Um, plus, plus, you know, obviously it's a job. So you're be able to support your family. And I think it's interesting. I wouldn't say everyone's motivated or everyone's values are sure doing good and serving others. I think I, I feel that way. And, and obviously you feel that way. Um, but I've been, you know, one thing that's been really important to me, is, as I said, is understanding my value system and then also having the right people around me, whether those are mentors or I sometimes call them like my advisory board. Um, because I have to know that not everyone might have the same perspective or approach or, uh, values as I do. So I want to understand like, what are my blind spots? So mm -hmm. I've talked a little bit about some of the challenges in my role, role or making sure that I might some might think something's really valuable, or I might think that something's the right idea for someone. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm asking other people like, Hey, Regina, from your perspective, you know, here's what I think. What am I missing? Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Is there some sort of risk that I'm not understanding or assessing? Um, so that's, that's also been something that I think is really important is trying to understand like my values, but knowing that other people's values might be different. Um, and that's you know, okay. And, and, and that's, that's okay. okay. And that's okay. <laughs> and frankly, that's probably, that's good. That's what makes teams really good. That's what makes, uh, helps us progress forward and, you know, to plug our value add programs, there's two different value add programs that we have that actually help people um, with actually understanding values and then understanding differences and perspectives. So one of our program partners is we the predictive index. It's basically a behavioral assessment, kind of like if you've done a DISC or a Myers-Briggs. But what it does is it um, is a really fast assessment that spits out results that show your operating style or your predictable behaviors. And so then what we could do is we can give you language around like, here's generally speaking, how you're going to operate. Like you're going to be more dominant than collaborative. You're going to be more socially extroverted than uh, analytical and introverted. You're going to be uh, more formal rules-based than you are going to be more flexible and informal. You're going to be more impatient than you are like patient and consistent, whatever, you know, whatever the different words are. And then we could say, and then here's how your team is. Here's how people you might interact with can be similar or different than you. Um, and that's really eye-opening for people. And then we also partner with EXO. So you've been to our on-site facilities. They're a, a sustainable high performance or a human performance company. And a lot of people think of them as like, you know, oh, the gym, I want to get physically fit. But a huge part of what they do is also mental fitness mindset. Well, we need that. Um, and so, you know, that I think is, it, there's just so much that's available to us. Um through our value-add programs, but just also, it, you know, generally speaking, when it comes to understanding who we are and then what motivates us and how we can use that to be better individuals or even be better, you know, be better professionals as well. For sure, for sure. And and I and I also know you mentioned it already briefly, but I know that FS Investments, you know, they do a lot of good work with their employees, um, but they also do a lot of great work in the community. Uh, yeah. I, and I know you're, you know, you're active in the community and, and I see it on the social media. So, um, you know, they're not just uh, doing the talk, they're doing the walk. Yeah, no, it's interesting when you when, you know, pivoting back to the time that I was in Argentina and I left FS, I wasn't even sure if I was going to come back to the organization. Frankly, my poor husband was 
wasn't thrilled that I left him for eight months to move to a foreign country and then just come back to the exact same company that I was at previously. Because, you know, originally I thought maybe this was an opportunity for for me to pivot my career into something different. I had always done English. Um, t- I'd always taught English as a second language as a volunteer. And probably like a lot of people during the pandemic, I had this crisis of conscious where I was trying to understand like how I was spending my time. Um, and was I really, you know, in spending like the amount of time that I was spending working versus volunteering, was there an opportunity to try and take that part time of my life and make it full time? So I did it. Um, and I, I did a lot of networking while I was in Argentina. I talked to for profit companies that were really mission driven. I talked to nonprofit organizations. I talked to um, the government, you know, federal, federal government positions, local government positions. And ultimately, you know, I really tried to focus those conversations on like, here's what's important to me. And here's what I'm good at. So like, these are my skills. And these are my values and passions. And through all of that conversation, I I, I came back to FS. <laughs> That's- um well, good. I mean, that's a testament to them as a company that you yeah. went through that entire process and still said, this is a great place to work. Yes. Um, and and I think it's important, you know, I do a lot of outside of the value add programs, I do a lot of mentorship um, where I try and connect with younger people, women specifically, but I, you know, any person that's, that's interested, I'm always open to connecting with, but then I also constantly, like I mentioned, seek out those opportunities to, and it doesn't even have to be mentorship. I just really consider it trying to expand my worldview. Um, so, you know, for like top down mentorship and then also trying to, to mentor people as well, which I think is really important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm always about like, hey, let's help the person, you know, below us, pull them up and then reach your hand up and have somebody above you help pull you up so that everybody's getting to the next level. I think think a good way to do it. That is something that's very timely for me Um, as a manager and as someone who is at the mercy of company policy. Because the the thing that I hate most, whether I'm the one saying it or I'm the one being told it is, well, that's how it's always been done. Oh, well, that sounds yeah. like <laughs> that sounds like a terrible reason to keep doing something. If it's because it's how it's always been done and it makes sense, fabulous. But if it's because it's how it's always been done, perhaps, but perhaps it's something that we could iterate, modify, change, enhance, wouldn't that make more sense? If I can... If I can do something, if I did something a certain way and it was really terrible and I had a horrible time, I don't want to make the people behind me, like, I'm not going to be like, well, I did it so you can do it too. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah. I did it and it was tough. So let's make it different. I'm I'm specifically referring to parental leave policies. Um, I just had a baby. So, you know, that's something that's been top of mind for me. Well, so then that kind of goes right into that next question. What are some of the challenges as a professional woman? And I know how hard it is to be a working mom, especially in the financial industry. So tell us what your thoughts are on that. So it's such a good question. And I've I've thought a lot about it because it goes back to this this mentorship question. Frankly, I feel like I haven't had as many challenges as I might have expected. And I think a big part of that is the way that I was raised. Um, My mom was always the type of mom who was like, if you want to do if you want to try it, we'll do it. And obviously, like there's some implications baked into that around like privilege and access to to certain things. Um, But my mom was always the type of person who believed in me enough that like, if you're, you want to play the piano? Sure. We can play the piano. You want to take our classes? We can, we can try it. Our classes. Um, You want to play field hockey? Sure. You want to play lacrosse? Let's try it. And so I always had this mindset that like, if I wanted to do something, I at minimum could try to do it may or may not be successful. Um, That's good. You tried. 
And so I think that was a really big thing was the way I was raised. And then I was an athlete my whole life. Um, so, you know, I always had coaches and teammates. And so I, I have always been very comfortable, um, in a team environment. I've always been very comfortable receiving feedback. I've always been very comfortable, like understanding that you have to like, you know, have a strong work ethic, put in the like, practice in order to play the game. So some of those things I think have put me in a position to be successful, to be comfortable with adversity. Like a lot of the things that maybe would be, would be challenges. Like I've always had a lot of confidence, things like that. Um, but I do think that motherhood has definitely been a challenge for me as a woman that obviously other people who haven't gone through that experience, whether they're just women who haven't, um, been in that situation or, or, or men who haven't been the the primary caretaker. Um, it's challenging to have a new hat and, and and talking about identities and new identity and how does that fit into my professional persona, my personal, like I'm still a person. I'm also a mother. And so, you know, yes. that's a challenge, just navigating that, balancing all of that. One of the things that has been really valuable, I already mentioned it, was the family network that we have at FS. And I think the point here is just the benefit of giving people access to resources. Um, and again, the, the benefit of network and, and even mentorship. I attended I was newly pregnant. Nobody even knew I was pregnant. I went to the meeting under the guise of being an ally, which is always important. Um, but it was it was the new parents meetup. And so they were talking about the challenges that they were experiencing and facing and um, how they navigated some of the issues around, you know, coming into the office, balancing everything, the emotional stress, the physical stress, everything. And just being able to know what people were going through allowed me to mentally prepare for it. Huge, huge. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. But being able to hear it gave me the opportunity to prepare for it. Yeah. Oh, that's that's invaluable. That's amazing. Such a great idea to go to the meetings. Yeah. And now, you know, I've continued to to stay engaged and be a part of of that network. Um, and I've also had access to uh, now, and now I literally have a network. So, you know, for little things like, Hey, I'm having a difficult time understanding the, uh, paid parental leave policy or the family leave policy, or how do I file this FLMA disability yeah. form? Yeah. Now I yeah. have people who can help. Um, yeah. That's not a fun, that's not a fun road. Building my baby registry. You wouldn't even know that that's a really hard thing to do. And um, being it living in Philadelphia, I live in a small row home. Very different to build a baby registry when you're living in a tiny space than when you're living in a house with more square footage. When you you wouldn't yeah. even think about that. So, you know, having colleagues who had gone through that, that was helpful too. Yeah. Yeah. Have your support group, have your mom group. I still have a mom group like... Um, Mine was, I, I didn't have those groups within my work. <laughs> it just wasn't a thing back then. I literally had to go pump in a closet um, because it just wasn't available any, at, that age, at that stage. But I've always had mom friends and even clients who, you know, their kids were a little bit older than mine. And I always talk to them like, Hey, what are you doing? What do you, what do you do about this? What was your experience with that? And it is so, so helpful to have that knowledge and to share the experience and then to share it with somebody who is newer at it than you, not just to share the pain, but to share the joy and to help each other out with how to navigate it because there yeah. are some tough days. For yes, a hundred percent. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting, the pumping in a closet, because I travel for work sometimes. And so that's probably, I, you know, I don't, it's such a challenge. I mean, there have been times where I've gone into offices. The, the world is a lot better. There are a lot more spaces from others. Um, but I went into a, a big financial advisor um, branch, assuming it was Philadelphia, assuming it's 2024, they would have 
some sort of room. They didn't. So I had to just go in some someone's office. Um, I also, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I am the type of person who I try and be shameless about it. I mean, I really try to not be ashamed of, of what I'm doing because I think it's important um, for people to know. So, you know, I, I don't try and I'm professional about it, but I, I communicate with people like I have to go pump, you know, one, one office I showed up really early and they said something like, can she wait in the lobby? And I said, I need, I just need access to a, a room so I can, so I can pump. And of course they, you know, they let me up early, but um, I can't imagine, you know, maybe five, 10, 15 years ago, people didn't feel comfortable talking about it. They felt like they had to hide it or be ashamed of it. So I think it's important to raise awareness. I don't know. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. All day long, all day long. And it goes back to our yeah. conversation earlier about just trying to make it a little bit easier for people who come after us. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it is, it is, you know, just like with everything, it's, like, it's progress, right? It's not perfection. It's progress. Uh, and if 100%. we get a little bit more progress and a little bit more progress and a little bit more progress, then we're going to be okay. Well, it'll get better. Right. Exactly. That's the goal. Yeah. So let's switch gears and get into our time machine and talk about your vision of retirement. My husband is a financial advisor. So I I think even if he wasn't, we talk about this question all the time. Like once a week, he's like, all right, what's our dream? What's our goal? If we win the lottery today, what are we doing? Couple visions. Um, I would love to live on a sailboat mm. in the Caribbean. Ooh. Because Ooh. from a financial resource perspective, you just have your sailboat and food. You don't really need to pay for, you know, pay a docking fee maybe, but it's a not tons of, you don't have to pay to keep up a house and, you know, all of the expenses that come with it. Um, yeah. So that's one vision. I just want to watch the sunset every day. Other Beautiful. vision would be a self-sustaining farm, kind of like a homesteady vibe. Uh, we would have goats so I could make cheese. We would have chickens for eggs. I would have a vegetable garden and wildflowers so I could make jams. And then I could sell all of those things at a farmer's market. The idea here is that we would be mostly off the off of the grid and not have to participate in the financial markets, except I am not comfortable. Uh, I would not be able to slaughter any animals. So we would have to either barter mm -hmm. or participate enough in the system so that I could have financial resources to, um, to pay for meat and protein. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I have a friend in Georgia who does just that, her and her partner, have a farm and she's always pulling stuff in to can and to yeah it's amazing yeah and th th this isn't and there would also be a winery component i would i would make wine oh there'd be some great love that <laughs> um <laughs> oh, man and, yeah and i'm i'm this is not that far off of a reality i have a, a tiny patio garden so i'm already i've already got my green thumb um i drink wine so i just have to learn how to make it <laughs> that's good hey we got goals we got we have goals yeah no but um working towards them yeah I know you know my husband and I we really do we fluctuate between we we obviously want to leave a legacy for our for our we our, our son who we just had and any future children um you know I read in your book you hate debt um so do we mm -hmm. when my husband and I first met we are really goal oriented we write out every year financial goals, personal goals, um, and professional goals. And one of the first times we did that, he had a certain amount of debt. And like within the first couple of years that we were dating, he had gotten rid of all of his debt. And so, um, you know, we don't, we, knowing the, Im the impact of debt, leverage can be great. We know it. Um, but we wouldn't want our, our children to have to have like, you know, tons of, of debt. We've got the 529 plans already set up. Oh, good job. Quick, quick plug for your, for your book. I texted my husband today based on, um, the, um, you might, your men, I don't know if you call him a mentor to me. He seems like your mentor, Michael, who oh, yeah. had you, 
invest your first stock. I'm stealing the idea. I texted my husband. I said, we should every year on our baby's birthday, buy him one share of a stock and up until the point that he can start to make decisions for himself and do the same thing. Ask him, you know, we're you're gonna, for your birthday, you'll get a toy, but you'll also get one share in a company. Maybe it's Mattel he's investing in. And, yeah. um, you know, by the time he's old enough, he'll hopefully have like a little bit of a nest egg and he'll have an understanding of financial markets and, you know, the, the understanding of, of money. So that was a rambly answer to your question, but, you know, I think about it a lot. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so cool. So cool. Yeah. And there's drip programs. There's also so many cool things and something doing something like that for your children is going to be timeless. It, you know, first of all, it'll be educational at some point, but, you know, think about the time of that money to grow and it it is, it could have a huge impact down the line. So good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Well, you were my inspiration for that idea. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, Ginevra, I have so enjoyed our conversation and I'm so grateful for you being here today. And I can't wait to explore more things with you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for the time. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. And we want to thank everyone else for listening. I think our um, call to action today is to do something that's going to help you in your future, whether or not it's paying off your debt or if you have a child, buy them that, you know, share or two of stock every year instead of a ton of toys. Think about the future and how you can set them up for a better future or for yourself for a better future. And with that, I want to thank you again. I'm Regina McCann Hess, president of Forge Wealth Management. Our website is forgewealth.com. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Forge Wealth. On LinkedIn, Regina McCann Hess. Go make it a great day. <laughs>